So I told you our kidneys have a lot of functions, and we just talked about um, one of those really important functions, um, basically the production of urine, getting rid of waste products. So it's important to do that because um, our blood composition depends on um, what is put in the urine, what is taken in from our diet, obviously, and then cell metabolism. There we go. Oh, of course. Okay. So the kidneys um, have four different roles that they do in maintaining blood composition. They get rid of um, waste products, which is the production of urine, which we talked about. They help in maintaining a fluid-based balance or a water balance of the, of the body or blood. They maintain electrolyte balance. And they maintain pH. They help in maintaining pH. So how much water is actually in the body? Our body, you've always heard, is predominantly water. Well, depending on your age, you're going to have more or less water. So young adults are composed of around 60% water, um, 50 to 60%. Um, babies are going to be um, composed of about 75% water, and elderly about 45%. Um, but the amount of water is going to be associated also with your health. So if you have um, less adipose tissue, you're going to be more hydrated. If you have more adipose tissue, then you have less hydration. So adipose tissue only um, contains about 20% water. So think about it. I mean, it's fat, and fat and water don't mix. Um, skeletal muscle, on the other hand, is very um, aqueous or watery. So if you have a lot of muscle on your body, then you're going to have a lot more water. You're going to be less, or you'll, you're going to be less prone to dehydration. Um, Elderly individuals tend to be at a higher risk for dehydration than um, young adults, which is why we're always worried about elderly individuals because they have the least amount of water in their system. So where is all this water that we're talking about? Water occupies three main places. We have intracellular, extracellular, and then our plasma. So intracellular fluid is fluid inside of our cells. Extracellular fluid is fluid outside of our cells, and blood plasma is extracellular fluid, but um, it's associated with our blood It's specifically. So let's look at that. Um, intracellular fluid, the fluid in our cells, um, this makes up about 40% of our body weight. Um, interstitial fluid is um, the extracellular fluid found outside of our cells, but it's not part of our blood plasma. And then the remaining fluid is blood plasma. Okay, so we have here we have 100% of the extracellular fluid. 80% um, is interstitial, 20% is, is, is blood plasma, okay? Oh, and I didn't mention, this makes up about 20% of the body weight. And so what's found in these fluids? We have lots of dissolved nutrients. We also have waste products and other ions that are going to be moving between our blood plasma, so our cells, our blood plasma, and our um, interstitial regions to other cells. So how is water and, and electrolytes, how are they linked together? Electrolytes are charged particles, and what they do is they conduct electrical currents in our extracellular, intracellular um, regions. So um, electrolytes are things like sodium ions, potassium ions, calcium ions. Those are all considered electrolytes. Bicarbonate ions are electrolytes. 
And why do we need these electrical impulses? Well, let's think back to our nervous system. Our nervous system needed electrical impulses so that we could send signals from our brain to and spinal cord to different regions of our body and then back. And think of the muscular system, which also uses electrical impulses to um, stimulate movements of the body. Um, so let's talk about how we regulate water intake and output. Um, there has to be regulation, just, I mean, we have to maintain homeostasis of water. And so the amount of water that comes in, in general, is what we, we want to have equal the amount of water that is released to maintain normal hydration. We don't want too much overhydration. We don't want underhydration. So the majority of the water that we get comes from um, things that we take into our body, like um, actual water or foods or fluids that contain water. Um, a very small amount is produced water via metabolic activities like aerobic respiration. Or I could say another one, dehydration synthesis is another example. So here we have that metabolic water up here. Um, here's food water, so there's always water in certain foods. Um, and then down here, we have beverages. So where does the output come from? The majority of the output is urine, but we do have water loss via um, our skin. So sweat and um, transpiration through the skin. Uh, the water that is lost through breathing and speaking or lungs. Um, water lost in fecal matter. So how does this water balance work? Our hypothalamus has a region known as the thirst receptor, osmoreceptors, that are sensitive to um, the amount of water in our system and the hypothalamus become active when we have a higher solution of um, charged or of, of ions. So if we have more ions or more um, electrolytes um, than we did in a solution, um, that's going to stimulate that osmoreceptor. And so that's going to cause us to be thirsty, which is then going to also, um, or so that's going to cause the thirst center to stimulate us to be thirsty. Um, also, that decrease in um, solution or water in our interstitial fluids and in our um, blood plasma is going to stimulate sal salivary glands to stop releasing saliva so we don't waste that fluid, which causes us to have a dry mouth. And that also will stimulate um, the thirst mechanism, which will cause us to want to drink. So we have insensible and sensible water loss. Insensible water loss is water loss that we cannot measure. So in general, you cannot measure the water that leaves through um, breathing and speaking. So that's from the lungs, as well as transpiration through the skin. Things that you can measure would be called sensible water loss. You can measure the amount of perspiration fecal matter, and urine. The hypothalamus also stimulates our posterior pituitary gland to release antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone is going to act on our kidneys and it increases the amount of water reabsorption that we have. So this hormone increases water um, in a different mechanism. So instead of us drinking water, it increases the amount of water we reabsorb by producing little tiny structures called aquaporins. 
there we go. Um, and then when we have um, different amount of electrolyte concentrations, that's going to stimulate movement of water from one environment to another. So if we have more electrolytes on one side of a membrane um, than on another side, water is going to move towards those electrolytes. So water always follows salt. Remember that. Um, and because in general, electrolytes can't move across a semi-permeable membrane. Because remember our plasma membranes are composed of phospholipids, which don't allow charged molecules like electrolytes to move. Um, this is going to cause water to move. So that's known as osmosis. So water moves from one side of the membrane to another side of the membrane. Um, another hormone that is released in response to changing electrolyte balance is aldosterone. Aldosterone helps regulate the amount of um, sodium ions in an environment. And in doing so, it stimulates um, the movement of water. Because remember, if we have more sodium on one side of a membrane, water is going to follow sodium. So um, another mechanism in maintaining water is the renin angiotensin mechanism. So we talked about renin a short bit. I told you that renin is produced by your kidneys and it helps to maintain or it, it converts another protein into eventually angiotensin 2. Remember that um, at the beginning of the lecture? So um, renin which is produced by our kidneys in response to low blood pressure is going to be released. And in our blood plasma, we have these proteins called angiotensinogen proteins, which are inactive proteins that just kind of float around. Um, renin converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin, which is then converted in the lungs to angiotensin two. And angiotensin 2 is a very strong vasoconstrictor, which causes our blood vessels to constrict. And it also triggers the release of more aldosterone, which stimulates more salt or sodium uptake. And I just mentioned this, but renin um, produces, helps in the production of angiotensin 2. It um, converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin, which then is converted to angiotensin 2 in the lungs. And then angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction and increases aldosterone release. And this increases um, sodium uptake, which increases water uptake, and then vasoconstriction um, increases the pressure in our blood. And so this figure shows um, if we have low blood pressure, the hypothalamus osmoreceptors are going to respond. Um, they're going to activate the posterior, or they, they are going to activate the thirst response. Um, this is also going to stimulate um, the posterior pituitary hypothalamus will stimulate the posterior pituitary to release antidiuretic hormone. And this stimulates the uh, production of more aquaporins and the collecting ducts, which then increase sodium, or I mean, not sodium, water reabsorption. Um, so if we have low blood pressure, this also causes a reduced filtrate volume or solute content. Um, juxtaglomerular cells are going to respond to that by releasing renin. Renin then um, leads to the production of angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 um, activates uh, or stimulates vasoconstriction in our arterioles, which increases blood pressure, and stimulates um, our adrenal cortex to release more aldosterone, which produces or which act or causes the kidneys to increase reabsorption of sodium, which then causes reabsorption of water, which increases blood volume.
Come on. There we go. So um, at this point, you should be able to tell me how the kidneys maintain fluid, fluid and electrolyte balance, how much water is typically taken in, what the mechanisms of water intake versus uh, mechanisms of water removal, what is sensible and insensible water loss, what is the thirst mechanism, how is ADH um, or how does ADH function and maintaining water balance and how does the renin angiotensin aldosterone system regulate water balance. I'm going to stop here and we'll get into the next video in just a few minutes. Bye.